After a shake-up of the narrative push and delivery from Watsi, Akemi Dawn Bowman has been given the task of not only introducing us to brand new protagonists and reintroducing us to an unrecognisable Kamigawa, but also making these stories relevant to the ongoing arc that's been built up over the past year, and it's fair to say the results have been exciting. Welcome to Magic the Flavouring, the Magic the Gathering podcast, where we talk about all things magic, flavour design and lore. I'm your host, Andy Mann. Hello, this is Nathan Cancel. And today we are going to be talking about the Kamigawa Neon Dynasty story. This is our story review episode for Kamigawa, uh, and we're releasing it r- r- kind of early, I guess you would sort of say. But they've they've done the story. They did the story before they released the cards. So you're you're right. They did three days of intense storyline. So it was like the twenty fifth, twenty sixth, twenty seventh, whatever it was. And then as soon as that last episode dropped on the story website. One and a half hours later, they started spoiling the main cards, and uh, yeah, it's pretty wild. It's, I mean, for for a start, we'll get into like the review of the story in a second. But what do you think of that? I think it's pretty I mean, fucking good, isn't it? Let's just hope that they don't see this really good thing they did, and then somehow not do it again. From what I've from what I've heard, the um, feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. Like they should have been doing this forever. Like the whole point is like it's so much more excitement built for the cards. When you know the story, because you're like, oh, well, then how we, what, I wonder what this character is going to look like. And oh, are we going to see this moment? And then when you see the cards, they matter way more because you're like, oh, that's that moment in the story. Instead of being like, oh, well, I guess this person does this thing. Can't wait to see that in the story. For some, like, it just doesn't have the same gravitas when you're kind of reading about it when the cards yeah, are in the Yeah, 100%. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Home, home run, home run. I mean, we were talking about uh, in the last episode, I mentioned that Rachel Agnes, who's, um, I think she's global brand manager. That's officially her title for Wizards of the Coast. Um, but again, we know her through like social media and when she was on game nights and whatever else. Um, and was asking people, she was asking people on Twitter, like, uh, what do you think of all this push and blah, 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 blah. Obviously everyone was giving her good feedback and just the, the, you could see the joy from them and other members of like the, not, not just the world building team, but like really mainly like the brand team and the marketing team going, Oh good. You know, for once people don't hate us for something like that we did. They actually like applaud something that we did in terms of we are deli- like, we do care about this game. Like funny enough, the people who work for wizards do want to see the story survive and thrive. And, you know, so it was really good to sort of see them get edified. I will say <laughs> that releasing, the spoilers and some of the big like narrative spoilers on cards after the story is a good thing but is maybe still a a little bit null and void to release it less than an hour or like less than a couple of hours after the last story drops yeah that yeah there was a little bit of like um i think i i specifically got halfway through episode five and then like the preview video started coming out so i was like oh that's right i'll finish this later like cool and i'd watch the stream then obviously I got to the end of the stream and and the two cards they revealed right at the end of the epilogue. And I was like, oh, definitely should have finished those last 200, yeah, yeah. 300 yards of words then, really, shouldn't have I? Oops. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, but whatever. So I mean, we'll get It still there. hit me like a fucking gut punch, though. So it was kind of, it, I guess it's best of both worlds, right? If you read it first and you got that whole, oh my shit, the guys that aren't reading the story, are, aren't, they're not even ready for it. Or like you watch the uh, release stream and then you had the, the the story kind of drop there as well. It's like, oh shit, the guys that aren't watching this, oh man, like they, they've missed out on that kind of the, 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 the reveal as it is, the curtain coming up. And I feel like doing it both within the same hour means that no matter if you're, which one, no matter which one you're keeping up with, right, you get the reveal at the same time, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, either which way, it was, it was really well handled, really well done. So, mm. um, yeah, big props to the brand and marketing teams, I suppose. And big props as well to Akemi Dawn Bowman, who was the author for all five uh, of the main story articles and also the uh, prologue, which they've put in the side story section on the mothership. So there are effectively, there are effectively six episodes. Because mm. usually what they've been doing is they've been doing four to five main uh story episodes and then they'll do four to five side stories and then the side stories will maybe sometimes intersect with the main story but not always or they might tell different things and blah 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 blah. this time around they essentially did episodes one to five here's the bulk of your story but a few months ago or like if sorry about a month ago sorry they released kaito's origin story kaito being the planeswalker protagonist that we follow through the main bulk of the story and as much as we were just talking about it before we hit record that you could read episodes one to five without having read the epilogue. It is essentially just like episode zero. Like, so you might as well read it as part of the large narrative to get like a fuller backstory and also just to kind of ease you back into Kamigawa. Cause as much as as it's a kind of a reboot for Kamigawa, it, it still isn't a total reboot. So I think it is nice to have like, you know, 
this kind of thing to ease everyone in at the same pace. People who have, you know, liked Kamigawa since they started playing the game, like yourself, or people who have no idea what Kamigawa is because we haven't been there in like fucking, you know, eight years or whatever it is. So I think, yeah, six stories total, I think. And that's, we will be doing all, all six of these like little stories as well. I mean, what, what do you think of them doing like a separate epilogue or a separate, sorry, prologue rather than separate side stories? Do you miss not having the side stories? Because it doesn't look like we'll get them. I'd, I'd be surprised if we didn't get side stories because they, they can release those after the cards have been released, right? Because it kind of even works with, you give us a bunch of legendaries and then it's kind of like, oh, that is really cool. I wonder if we're going to see a side story from them. And then they happen to go, well, yeah, we actually gave you another four different legendaries as well as this like kind of concise... Yeah, I mean- I mean, maybe. Have they, has there been confirmation or not that there's going to be other side Well, no, stories? not in either way. Sorry, that was an assumption made by me, because not only do we have the side story, the, which is the prologue, but obviously they've also included another section, uh, which is saga stories, which are like little mini, as we said before, vignettes. they're almost like little yeah. lore blitzes, vignettes, exactly, five, six hundred words on each of the saga cards, which kind of bridge the gap. Um, so I just, I kind of wonder if this is our lot. But I mean, having said that, it makes it sound like we're not getting much at all. Um as people who will be seeing the little timestamp of how long this episode is, I mean, we haven't planned how long this episode's going to be. I'm going to tell you now, it's probably going to be hitting the 90-minute mark pretty comfortably, if not longer, <laughs> because whereas uh, Chaos and Rivera for uh, Crimson Bound and Midnight Hunt was able to tell those stories in a really nice, simple, the gang go here, then they go there, and then that's the story, and had like a really low-to-the-ground, like, just one or two beats, but like packing a lot in their stories. It's, just, it's all in the castle. <laughs> yeah, it's all in the second castle. Half is Crimson Vows like, are all yeah, in the castle. One location. And then, there you go. Yeah, Midnight Hunt is. They go to the festival. Oh, we need to go to the, get the key. Oh, we got the key back to the festival. And like yeah, all just five one stories quick are fetch able. quest, right? Yeah, one, yeah, yeah. One quick fetch quest. That was yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> in and out. Well, quick and, 20 minute and everything was like fairly <laughs> simple. And that worked to its benefit as well. Uh, this story is huge. Yeah. Meanders. And for, like for something that does not feature the Gatewatch. In any capacity whatsoever, this is a story. I'm going to say this again for anyone who's like jumping for joy. This is a story without the gate watching it. <laughs> like fuck, so much happens, and so many people's like different characters' motivations and narratives mm. and mini arcs, and histories as well. Man, there's like history. It's picking up from the stories from fucking 10, 15 years ago that you wouldn't have even expected. They're like, yeah, but this is all canonized. We had this. This is all planned. It all kind of fits in this timeline. Which yeah, what is it? Ag thing. Is it Agents of Artifice? That's the one that they're yeah, bringing on from. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. Right. So we've buried the lead long enough. Um, I'm going to do my uh, patented uh, ten minute story breakdown. Although God, I don't think I'm going to be able to break this down to ten minutes. Um, I'm, I just listener, please appreciate the fact that I've tried to condense this down into something that's manageable. Uh, also, if you haven't already uh, been able to tell, I have got a bit of a cold. Um, so if I do sort of trip up or go a little bit um, nasally, nasally? Nasally? I'm trying not yeah. to be gross. <laughs> if I go a little bit nasally. You want to start talking about your glottis, right? Your epiglottis. Oh, good. And we got there. Um, <laughs> then I do apologise. <laughs> um, but here we go. Okay, so Kamigawa, Neon Dynasty Dynasty. Prologue. Uh, we enter on Kaito, a teenage ninja from the plain of Kamigawa, who, uh, as a child, was taken in by the Imperials of Iganjo and is close friends with the Emperor, who has been missing for about a year at this point in the prologue. Uh, he has devoted his time to finding out what happened to her and to finding a man that he describes as having a metal arm, which he saw the night of the Emperor's disappearance. Uh, Kaito has found themselves working for a group called the Reckoners, who are an underworld gang in Kamigawa, uh, and gains leads... Uh, from the Reckoners to kind of further his quest to find the Emperor. He's tasked by them to find a moon folk called Tameshi and to just, uh, ta -ta 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 -ta, and to steal his research uh, for the gang itself. Kaito infiltrates the Jukai Forest, home of the Kami, to find Tameshi, uh, and along the way meets his sister, Aiko, who is a Kami diplomat for the Imperials. Uh, she helps him find the mark because they are in the Kami Forest. They eventually find Tameshi, who reveals his work uh, is to fuse the Kami with drones, which are like little animal uh, mechs uh, used by the denizens of Kamigawa. Uh, he does this to better understand the Kami, because there is uh, an idea that Kamigawa will eventually merge the spirit and the mortal realm, and Tameshi wants uh, Kamigawa to be as prepared as possible using technology for this eventual 
uh, reckoning. Uh, the kami Tameshi is most interested in is a Tanuki spirit uh, who Aiko recognizes as the same kami present when the emperor disappeared, something that she never told uh, Kaito when uh, he asked her about what happened during the emperor's disappearance. Uh, it is concluded that the technology that uh, Tameshi is making is too easily weaponized, but before any plans can be made as to what to do with this uh, technology, the group is attacked both by hostile kami in the forest and the reckoners who have been tracking Kaito. Uh, after a brief con- uh, conflict, the Tanuki Kami, who is known as Himoto, and Kaito form a strong bond, and the Kami fuses with the Tanuki drone uh, Tameshi made specifically for Himoto, and Himoto becomes Kaito's companion. Himoto re- is revealed to be also the Kami of the Spark, and uh, although it's not explicitly kind of expanded on too much in the story, is essentially the the kind of representation on Kamigawa of what happens when a spark ignites, because every facet of uh, Kamigawan culture has its own kami, so sparks igniting have their own kami, and it is Hamoto who is now uh, Kaito's little Tanuki buddy, which is pretty cool, and you see them on their card as well. Um, it is also implied in the uh, sort of closing parts of this prologue that the Emperor is also uh, in the multiverse somewhere, so there's this idea that maybe the Emperor has a spark that ignited as well, although that's not explicitly stated in the prologue. Uh, we then enter into episode one. So episode one opens about a decade earlier than the uh, prologue, uh, so this is when Kaito and uh, Aiko are about maybe sort of like eight or seven years old, uh, and they are growing up in the Imperial Palace, taken in as orphans. Kaito, not wanting to start the path of a samurai, which is kind of his chosen path, or his uh, guided path by his elders, is charged with being the sparring partner of the Child Emperor, as he possesses strong fighting abilities, as does the Emperor, it seems, when they spar. Uh, over the years, because the story then uh, progresses forwards uh, year by year, uh, through their training sessions and also secret conversations, we see Kaito and the Emperor become very firm friends, although he never learns the Emperor's name. We also see Kaito's interest in technology being stoked as he meets a futurist diplomat, uh, the futurists being one of the many sort of like factions in modern Kamigawa who want to explore technology for scientific research. Uh, the futurist diplomat arrives at the palace of the Imperials and is a moon folk who would also go on to mentor uh, Kaito's now friend, Tameshi, who we originally met in the prologue. Uh, we jump to the night, then we do another few years jump to the night that the uh, Emperor disappears, and we have Kaito finding the man with the metal arm inside the chamber of Kyodai. Uh, Kyodai is the kami of basically all of Kamigawa. It's like Kamigawa's like spirit, like kami, who uh, also has a very strong bond with the Emperor, because that's their form and function. Uh, there's uh, some business going on with the Emperor and Kyodai and the Man with the Metal Arm, that isn't expanded on here but the Imperials eventually blame the Futurists when they take Kaito's description of the Man with the Metal Arm to be one of the Futurists, so they think the Futurists are trying to attack and disrupt the Emperor Kaito disagrees with this, uh, and after a painful exchange with uh, his guardian a uh, Kitsune called Light Paws Kaito departs the palace to search for the Emperor uh, in episode 2 we jump a further decade forwards in time so this is now modern day uh, uh, so this is a decade after the Emperor's disappearance Kaito is now an experienced planeswalker uh, because we see that at the end of the prologue the Tanuki that uh, befriended Kaito Himoto uh, transformed into a mask and when Kaito put this mask on his face his own spark ignited so we now see that a de- decade later uh Kaito is now an experienced planeswalker and he comes back to Kamigawa to meet Aiko, his sister, who informs him that she has intel that Tameshi, the moon folk that they befriended during their prologue adventure, uh, has been working with a man described as having a metal arm. Kaito, to seek the truth, follows Tameshi to his lab in the uh, moon folk capital of Otawara and discovers blueprints for a strange device which is described as a a chip with squid-like legs. Uh, Kaito then follows Tameshi to a meeting that Kaito believes uh, is going to be with the man with metal arm but we actually see Tameshi's meeting is with a large metal monster quote unquote who we as readers immediately recognise as the Phyrexian creator Jin Cataxius uh, who I'm going to refer to now as Jin because saying Jin Cataxius about 50 times is not good news for me uh, so Jin then kills Tameshi uh, in the meeting and when Kaito confronts Jin uh, and his dying friend Tameshi utters the name Tezzeret so we now know that the man with the metal arm is Tezzeret. Tezzeret and Jin Kataxis have been working together on some nefarious plan in Kamigawa. 
Dun dun dun. Uh, Kaito then follows uh, the name Tezzeret to a Nizumi or Rat Folk village, which he knows was burned down by Tezzeret several years earlier. There are some references in this uh, little bit of the story in episode three to Agents of Artifice. There's also a little reference, a teeny weeny blink and you'll miss it reference to Nicobolus, because there was a dragon that came to bargain with the Nizumi for Tezzeret's life, because Tezzeret got knocked out during this encounter on Kamigawa pretty fucking cool uh and we find out that uh, the only witness to the fire's cause is a young nazumi called nashi and this uh nazumi called nashi was adopted by a Sar- saratomi moon folk called tamio so tamio is on the plane and it's also kind of interesting to learn we'll talk about this later but all of the cards that we see of tamio all the planeswalker cards we've ever had of tamio has been tamio existing at the same time as this like kamigawa full of technology which is kind of crazy to think about like the Kamigawa flow of technology has always existed in in the time frame that we've been playing Magic, which is kind yeah. of a bit of a mind fuck to think. Yeah, about. it's because Grandma never learned how to use a phone, right? So it's yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like she she doesn't care. She's like, a traditionalist. She, she cares she about scrolls the, and history. Yeah, she doesn't need the technology. She yeah, yeah. But it's just kind of it's just kind of wild. Um, cool. Yeah. Uh, Kaito meets with the Planeswalker Tamio, and after a discussion with Tamio, reveals that not only does uh, she know that Tameshi's chip is known as the Reality Chip but that the planeswalker known as the Wanderer, who Tamiyo met during the course of War of the Spark, is in fact the Lost Emperor. So it's confirmed that the Emperor has also had a spark that was ignited the night of her disappearance and has been the Wanderer all along. Shot with uh, Two-Face. Yeah, right. I mean, pretty cool. Like, we'll talk about the Emperor specifically, obviously, a little bit later in this episode, but, like, I'm I'm loving it. I'm loving all the little ties. Mm-hmm. They're bringing it yeah. back in. It's all good. Um, Tezzeret had tried to test the reality chip on Kyodai and the Emperor the night of the Emperor's disappearance uh, because the Emperor is spiritually linked to uh, Kyoda. Uh, their spark ignited, but the uh, experiment was the thing that left the Emperor's uh, spark unstable. So the very nature of the Emperor not being able to stay in any one given place is because of Ter- Tezzeret's meddling with Kyodai, and it's all kind of linked in the kind of, you know, the way that Kamigawa links all this kind of stuff in with like spirituality and the soul and all that kind of thing. Uh, Kaito goes back to the lab where he found the blueprints uh, for the chip and steals the chip, uh, but with uh, but not with being con- but not without being confronted by Jin Kataxis and a bunch of ninja mercenaries. Uh, after escaping, Kaito is about to be caught by a dragon mech uh, when he is saved at the last moment by the Wanderer herself. So the Wanderer has now returned to Kamigawa. Episode 4, uh, Tamiyo uses the stolen reality chip to partially stabilise the Wanderer's spark. Uh, after forming a battle plan, Tamiyo and Kaito go back to the lab to destroy Jin's research, and whilst, uh, whilst the Wanderer stays at Iganjo to fend off an impending rebellion against a revolutionary group uh, known as the Uprisers, so if you have the Futurists, who are the kind of group that want to use technology to further science, and you have the Reckoners, who are like the criminal underworld, who are using technology for their own means, or for their own survival, I should say, you have the kind of uh, third faction, which are the Uprisers, who are trying to stop the Imperials, who are like the ruling class, from uh, controlling them with technology. The Uprisers are also like um, mainly Red Faction as well, which is uh, a yeah. pretty cool, like... like factions! Lots Welcome of factions. To... Welcome to different the faction factions. <laughs> well, yeah, different to factions that we had in the original Kamigawa as well. It's all kind of mixed together, which is really nice. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not just the same old thing. Uh, Tamiyo and Kaito find that the Kami that were the subject of Jin's experiments, because when Kaito first went to the lab, there was a bunch of uh, Kami all hooked up to machines. Uh, they've all been destroyed uh, or killed, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, and uh, Tamiyo and Kaito are ambushed by Tezzeret and Jin, the two of whom do their big villain reveal that the experiments on the Kami were really just pretests for experimenting on planeswalkers. Although we still, at this point in the episode, in the story, don't quite know what those experiments are for. But what we know is that the Kami were just a testing ground for whatever they were about to do to planeswalkers. Uh, Kaito and Tamiyo are saved by the Wanderer, eventually, who decides to planeswalk directly into the lab, uh, not content staying behind at the palace. And as the Wanderer planeswalks into the lab, she then lands a sword blow, across Jin Kataxias. So she literally goes, whoop, hey boys, smash! Like, and fucking cuts Jin Kataxias in half. Like, so cool. So badass. Like, oh, Such a boss. Fucking Wanderer is great. Um, episode 5, escaping from the lab with a paralysed Tezzeret, paralysed because of one of Tamiyo's uh, scrolls that's uh, holding a spell over uh, Tezzeret. 
the group arrive back at Aganjo uh, to fight off the uprisers. Uh, and at this point, Tamiyo is also in possession of the reality chip because they hypothesize that the reality chip can augment uh, Planeswalker's abilities. So Tamiyo wants to use their flying and uh, telepathic abilities to be augmented with the reality chip to make it easier to carry Tezzeret around. Lots of moving parts going on by episode, by episode 5. Uh, the Wanderer then intends to take Tezzeret to Kyodai for judgment and to potentially repair both their bond and her spark, because she figures that if he broke it, he can fix it. Uh, the group crash land into a Ganjo on the back of a mech that they find in Ottawara, literally just falling through the sky on the back of this broken down mech. Um, and when Kaito comes to, he and Tamiyo find Tezzeret chasing after the Wanderer through the battlefield. After a battle between Tamiyo and Tezzeret and Kaito, Tezzeret is almost beaten, uh, but he is able to control Tamiyo through the reality chip, because the reality chip is still technology, and he kidnaps her and escapes through his own inbuilt planar portal. Because if people didn't remember, not only can he planeswalk, because he is a planeswalker, but he also has the fucking planar portal in his belly, or wherever he keeps it. So he's just like a one-man planar portal dude, right? I mean, yeah. As long as it's in, as long as it's in organic, he can take it. He can so. take it. Like it's kind yeah. of. I mean, that's also like because I read that sentence it's, just I know. on the side, it's and up, I kept being right? like, "Well," because I was like, "Why does he need to? Did he planeswalk or did he use the portal?" And then in my head, I was thinking, "Oh no, of course he used the portal because he wouldn't be able to take other people planeswalking, like even other also planeswalkers." The chip. the chip as well had to survive, right? That's the re- main reason why. I'm sure. Thinking. Yeah. Exactly. So like. Yeah, so it does make sense, and I've always, and that kind of does also tighten up something where I'm like, what? What's the point of a planeswalker having a planar portal that they can carry around? It's like, oh right, yeah, so you they can take go to other planes with you or your favorite you chair, chair. Yeah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Yeah, nice yeah, and yeah, comfy. Yeah. <laughs> all right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, good, 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 good job, good job, wizards. Okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, the uprising leader finally is beaten by the wanderer, and uh, the wanderer feels their time on the plane is short again because the reality chip is no longer there. So they feel like, oh, my spark's about to fuck up. Uh, so they make Lightpaw, the region of Kamigawa, uh, to lead the plane of Kamigawa, and she planes walk whoop, away once more into the multiverse. Uh, Kaito at the end of the story, has, once everything is kind of resolved and tightened up, uh, devotes his life to not only finding the Wanderer once again, but also to finding Tamiyo to reunite her with her family, who we see during the story. We then have an epilogue, as we have done for a few of these story arcs. If anyone remembers mm. Kaldheim and the little epilogue at the end of Kaldheim, mm. here we go again, baby. Uh, mm. We are on Phyrexia. <laughs> with Jin Gataxius, who's got a shiny new body, courtesy of all his little minions, because he obviously got cut in half by the Wanderer. Cleft. Cleft in twain. Cleft in twain. Got twained, cleftly. Got twained. Uh, <laughs> Beautiful. And Jin Gataxius is there with uh, Tezzeret, and we see the newly completed Tamio as Tamio awakes from the experiment table. And we welcome to the multiverse the world's first Phyrexian planeswalker. Tezzeret's clearly suspicious of this new creation, but both creator and Tamio assure him that the process and the experiment is a success. Whoo! Oh, buddy. So Just, much going on. Yeah. I feel like FYI to any plane in the future, don't like don't dedicate your your resources to metal maybe like kaladesh maybe start like disassembling all the shit because it, at this point it's just an invitation right like i mean there are certain places that you feel like won't be that bad or as affected like theros that kind of thing I mean, we'll get into this we'll get anyway but yeah, yeah. metal man metals metals are bad 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 means bad I mean, things like, for these days i i don't know why i never made the pop culture connection before like it seems so painfully obviously to me now but tezra just magneto right He's yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like you have like, oh, Wolverine. Man. And oh, they always have that thing just... in the films where Wolverine jumps at him with his claws, and then Magneto like flips around. It's like, aha, yeah. I caught you midair, and it's like, well, of course you fucking did. You made a metal. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you <cool>. dinkers. <laughs> so, firstly, um, I'm just going to straight up say, like, I absolutely loved this story arc from start to finish. What a fucking ride this whole thing was, and like, yeah, just just absolutely fantastic. Uh, the author, Akami Dawn Bowman. Um, I mean, I I don't think they play magic like uh, Rivera did. I don't know, but they fucking they they get it. They absolutely get it. They get the stakes of the characters. They get what people care about when we're looking at like magic story. 
and they have exactly the right balance between oh hey isn't this funny like kind of young adult fiction and oh no we're actually trying to tell the story of like the narrative of the game like they've got it for me anyway i don't know about you they fucking knocked it straight down the middle and balanced everything absolutely perfectly i mean did you like this story Oh, hell yeah. Like, I think this is the kind of story that really benefits from, like, a second read. Um, like, because I read them episode by episode, and it can be, especially, like, the ep- um, the prologue, I find that it can be quite dense, like, to reestablish yourself in a world. There's all these new names coming at you, and you're kind of, like, rebuilding your little history, right, of, 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 of the of the story. And you're in, like, okay, what threads do I need to remember? What, who, which names are important? Kind of that idea. Yeah. And especially... A criticism that I have, I feel like, with a lot of magic stories at the moment is that they all really have this flashback kind of format where everything is, now it's 10 years in the future, and now it's five years in the past, and then it's a year later, and it's like, okay, cool, cool, great, cool. And in the moment, it's a bit much. Having reread the entire story today from front to back, having already read it once, it's much more easy to digest, and you because you know what's going to what's already going to go, sure. already happen in the future, it makes the things that have happened in the past kind of feel a bit like, more like, oh, okay, that's the payoff to this, and that feels like you get so much history, so much story of these characters in these six stories, like, the motivation is so clear, the relationships are so well developed, everyone's got their own very obvious identity, like, you even, like, when you were talking through the prologue, you just say, like, oh yeah, the leader of the Uprisers and the Emperor, yeah, they have a battle, and the Emperor wins, like, that actual scene is is really amazing. Yeah, like if you really read good. it, it's like as political idealisms like clash. It's so it's so good at, at world building. Um, and I say if it is the kind of story that you're reading it and you're feeling like God, it is a bit dense. This is actually quite a lot to take in. Just get to the end and then reread it again. It's really easy to skim back through again, and and everything starts yeah. into place. And it's so, such a beautiful, such a beautiful arc for um for so many of the characters. I completely agree. I mean, it's, I was thinking about it today, and I was thinking about something that really struck me. And I know I said it earlier about like, oh, this is a story with no gatewatch and ha ha ha. And there's the meme of like, oh, we're sick of the gatewatch on this podcast and bloody, bloody, blah. But in, in all seriousness, what hit me today when I was thinking about these stories was how we were following predominantly characters that we'd never met before. And I was so invested in their journey. Like, Yes, all right. For no Tamio, Tamio is like the kind of the grounded character that people are invested in that people know of. You have to have one or two, especially in a in a long running like IP like Magic the Gathering. It pays to have your characters be recognizable. It's why they do keep using the Chandra and Jace over and over again because people like them and they follow them through the story. But Tamio was really a tertiary character. The mm. three main characters of this story were Kaito, uh, Aiko, and the Wanderer. Right. Obviously, we've seen the Wanderer here and there, but the whole point of the Wanderer is that we had no idea who they were, and even less characterization for them, really. They just looked cool, and they had like cool abilities that we kind of saw. So there's these three characters who we know nothing about until we start the story, and I was completely invested in each one of them. And no, none of them were outright the hero, none of them were outright the villain, there was no, like... You know, heavy-handed, like, well, you know, this person's going to turn evil. Oh, this person's you no know, righteous, and this person's not. They all had their own realistic story arcs people are complicated right and it's very nice mm-hmm. and sometimes to have your pantomime villain like to have your tibolts and it's sometimes kind of nice to have your gideons who's just like he's the self super righteous he's the best kind of everything <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah but it's also nice to have characters that have moments of going through all these different things especially in like situations where you're trying to fight for your life every five seconds whilst trying to rediscover your like decades long childhood friend that got taken away in the Mm -hmm. night by mystic forces and you've fallen out with your sister and you've fallen out with your mentor and you've got a bunch of like mechanized gangsters running after you and oh my god there's a giant metal monster from beyond the stars who's here to kill us all and all these fucking like kami running around the place like it's quite a stressful situation and i just yeah i just i just loved how for a plane which is one of the least uh sort of like generic planes like it's so fantastical and so like extra like in its design and in the world that it builds to have such realness in the characters i thought was just yeah every step of the way i was absolutely with kaito every step of the way in this story 100 percent Mm. Yeah, no, it's like it, that. It's exactly how you say that kind of grounded quality that um, the story kind of has. It has everything has weight. Everything feels like it matters. Um, like the your the decisions, like they, they 
the way that Kaito is, for example, like character representations are so consistent. Like the amount of times that Kaito fucks up by just being Kaito, but not in a way that you blame him, in a way that you're like, no. well, of course that's what Kaito does. Because even in these five stories, you've only, I've only known him for five minutes and I already understand that this is the kind of thing, it, this is of course the way he's going to react. And no, I'm not going to get annoyed him because that's just what Kaito does. And you, mm. it, there are so many moments of brevity for his character throughout the story of where I've, I've highlighted a few of them. We'll get into it when we start, you know, case studying the characters a little bit. But he is such a positive representation of blue black, mm. which is really interesting because we do we have a blue black protagonist and and he, and it's very well executed and at no point mm-hmm. does he feel duplicitous or sinister or feel like again it's like a Kamigawa does, Kamigawa does this a lot like um, Umazawa was was a mono mono black protagonist uh, from before and we don't actually get too many of them like even Liliana's dressed up to be almost like that that foil to to the to the damsel in distress kind of kind of feeling right and mm-hmm. she plays against a lot of those typical stereotypes where kaito doesn't feel stereotypical he actually just feels typical he's relatable yeah. as well as being accented and he's down to earth even though what he does and how he acts is also quite admirable um yeah it's it's, it's really 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 well well handled and you get this I, I, for a lot of the characters and i think that's something that is also low key a benefit of having protagonists that for a change are native to the plane and are telling mm. a story that matters for the plane. And I'm not saying this is better. So a lot of what I'm going to say about like this story, I'm not saying that this way is how I would want to see it for every magic story. What I'm saying is, is that it's nice that we have it for this magic story. And what I mean by that is, is that there are so many different combinations when you're dealing with magic as an IP and you're trying to tell the story of a plane, whether it's one that you're returning to, like time again or one that you're starting off with there's a few different ways uh, that we've sort of seen and kind of almost like um tropes that magic writers have used to kind of explore the plane you either have your extra planar planeswalker who comes onto the new plane and then we as the audience discover this new plane through their eyes so we saw this in kaldheim is the most recent example i can think of where we were with kaya kaya's not from kaldheim so she's figuring out as we're going along and then she bumps into a couple of the natives whether they're planeswalkers or just regular people or whatever and they kind of go oh we're gonna go to this place and this is what this place does and the planeswalker goes oh that's funny that's like how i did this other thing and like we figure it out with them as we go the other thing that we do is we'll follow maybe just a, a central protagonist that is from the plane, but then we'll have like a, a tertiary character that is kind of our little voice. For example, in The Sundered Bond, when we're following Luca throughout the whole story, who, I mean, that Luca's is their own thing because they're a protagonist that turns into an antagonist, which is its own cool little spin. But we have Luca as the, the, the eyes that we're following through, but we also then have Vivian, who's in Mm. the background asking the questions that we want That mentor kind of character, right? Almost that kind of the the supplement to the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, they're there for us, right? Yeah. And there are all these... And there's a hundred different combinations, and those are, like, the big two, but then then there's combinations between whether you have, like, native villains or extra planar villains and how that affects things and all this stuff going on. And I think, whereas this... Where we did have native uh, planeswalkers as our protagonists in the um, Innistrad stories, we also had a lot of the Gatewatch kind of doing their thing. And the stories were kind of like very simple. And because Innistrad as a plane is so... uh, I'm trying to say it without saying the word boring, but it's so... Well, it's not new, it, right? It's so That's recognizable. Well, yeah, like no one isn't... It's a no one's not going to know... Yeah, no one's not going to know how a gothic horror plane works, right? It's mm. just... Especially for Western culture, it's just intrinsic. It's just like, yep vampires werewolves whatever else we don't need to learn about this plane any more than we already know about it whereas with kamigawa and a reboot of kamigawa no less this is essentially a new plane for almost all players and even if you're a returning player there are new rules and new factions and new boundaries and new everything for kamigawa it's a complete facelift for it so to do this with native planeswalkers is this is a long-winded way of saying that it felt natural and the characters felt natural because they do belong to this world. And mm. even though they understand the rules and we as the audience are kind of catching up as we go, it was it's just a testament to the writing this time that they're able to do all this without having that extra character being like, the futurists? Well, who are the futurists? Well, you see, the futurists are these, that, and the other people. Like, blah, 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 blah. The characters just live in the world. And the writing is so good that we are just able to jump in and just kind of go along with it for six episodes. And there's, there's, you know, nothing gets unanswered. Everything fits. Yeah, it's, it's really, all ex- really good. Because it's a, there is a lot of exposition, but it's all delivered as a, in terms of people not explaining it to new people. It's using 
is is using the um, their knowledge of the factions as an argument to like justify their position, right? Yeah. Like when Kaito is trying to defend the futurists against um, Lightpool, and Lightpool's kind of chastising um, them for obviously they need to have regulations and there needs to be processes and, and ways for the Imperials to kind of ensure that the technology is used safely. And Kaito's like, but the futurists. Um, don't or um the um opportunity for the poor is it, it doesn't give them a chance to use that technology if you put these kinds of remits on it it's almost like and it's almost like explains what the futurist position is but not yeah. we're not by going these are what they're like it's like well no these are the reasons why this is the argument this is the reason why i follow them and that that kind of idea it's a yeah. very clever way of doing exposition because it's using it's, it's justifying and expanding those factions and giving them a just a justifiable stance you know i yeah. don't know who is wrong i don't know who is right and everyone can individually all have the right point of views it's just whether or not we can and, and how, where that friction kind of hits right that's where the interest in yeah the story and it's all kind of just going in the background or i mean actually it's the opposite the, the main story like the big like the overarching theme as it were for for the weight of um of magic story as a whole is this random little group of of, of secretive Phyrexian set this Phyrexian cell you know hidden in in the middle of the city that, you, that that is kind of behind the backdrop of political strife it's kind of similar to Kaladesh right of where you have the outlaw as it uh, outlaws as it were against the system right because you had the consulate yeah. and then you had the um um renegades. the rebellion the renegades exactly and it's kind of got similar parallels but it's a bit different because it's more a matter of traditionalism um versus futurism rather than having yeah. um control over i mean it's similar it's similar but it's, it's there just are very similar enough. stories but then they are quite similar planes in terms of like the themes and sort of logistics that they're not yeah i guess they are now right like yeah, yeah. there is a lot of similarities between them. i mean i just you know it's just we always get quite dry and a little bit sort of like philosophical when we talk about these stories but that's only because the storylines recently have just been so fucking good and mm-hmm. just like it again. We've you said it earlier. And I think I, I I parroted you. I'm going to do it again. Everything matters in this story. Every there's no like, you know, nothing's just like throwaway. It's you know we need to get the wanderer and we need to get the wanderer to their spirit Kam- of, of Kamigawa Kyodai because Kamigawa is in trouble. We need to fix the factions because the factions are all going to kill each other. Kaito needs to find the Emperor because the Emperor is his only friend. And like, you know, it's everything like actually has a purpose. And it's not just mm-hmm. and it's all it's all so relatable in little microcosms that it doesn't just feel like too big. Like this isn't just the Gatewatch going like, well, if we don't stop the dragon god, the multiverse will explode. And you're like, what what does what does that even mean? Like what yeah. is the, how how can you even fathom those concepts? This is a story about like, well, we can't leave Tamio behind. Because not only do we not trust that big metal motherfucker, we've also like met her family and we like them. So can we please go and get Tamio back? Like you know, mm-hmm. it's 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 you know, everything matters to on a personal level. You have the the character of Tameshi. So Tameshi is the Moon Folk who kind of gets I think gets a little bit lost in the story because the story is quite big, but they're quite important to start with. Tameshi is the Moon Folk who Kaito uh, has to find for the Reckoners in the prologue, and after sort of like having a bit of a debate about the philosophies of weaponizing technology or whether it's for the benefit of Kemigawa or against it, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Tameshi and Kaito become friends. But they don't become friends and then Tameshi goes, well, I guess I'll never use technology again. Like, they have their own motivation. And then mm. so that we find 10 years later in like later stories that Tameshi has been working with Tezzeret. That doesn't assassinate Tameshi's character. And although there's lots of ideas about betrayal and who's betraying who and Kaito feels like he's betraying Tameshi by sneaking around to stalk him and to like follow him and all this kind of thing you know this is really a story about one friend and another friend having political differences ideologies, and does that, right? and does, yeah ideologies and does that trump a friendship because they are mm-hmm. clearly friends like everyone has a friend who they think oh yeah like you know that's Paul that's my mate Paul he's a dickhead like, but we love him because he's, you know, he's Paul. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And like, but yeah. when you're when you're dealing with like these big ideological sort of rifts, and obviously, like in our real world, everything is so divisive and politically charged nowadays. So I guess we can't really relate because we we tend to expunge people who have different ideas to us, both rightly or wrongly. Like that's a whole other debate. Um, like the the last thing that Kaito and Tameshi they have their little interaction. Kaito needs the information from Tameshi, but you in the story he's regretting the fact that he has to interrogate his dying friend you know mm. it all matters yeah i'm standing up for your beliefs and everything really i mean and that's the whole point right is it really sets the the situation of like 
it makes sense why the uprisers wouldn't feel they need to act because without a emperor the plane is kind of falling to shit right and the uprisers believe that they need to dissolve the the throne as it were or the position um because it creates you know too much of a gulf but it's classism right it's classism and, and, and also uh, that idea that factionism i think it's very apt for the current world that we live in where everything as you say yeah. is very divisive and it's really nice for everything to be undercut with uh, a want of understanding right because aiko and kaito uh, essentially are two sides of the coin with Ka- aiko being an imperialist who's trying to strengthen the bonds between the kami and and the humans because obviously there's in the background as well like there's the spirits versus the humans right that's not really a thing in this set as much because it was already the focus of the entire block of the original kamigawa block you know mm. the spirit world versus the the human world even though that was all a misunderstanding as well like it's always some weird shit going on in the background that's actually important but it gets it causes massive wars and and, and issues right but she's someone who's trying to strengthen kami kami bonds and and and, and the relationship between the two whilst you've got kaito who beyond I guess the one thing I'd say about Kaito is beyond his want and need uh, to find the um, emperor, just wants fair. It, his I guess his motivation is very similar to Tameshi's, right? He just wants there to be a fair access, right, for everything mm-hmm. to, 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 for, of technology. Um, and they're very they like it, what they want and how they want it um, might differentiate massively, but that doesn't lessen their bond together or their understanding of each other, and they just accept each other for knowing that that's just the way they're going to be. Even from the prologue, you see there's so much understanding of like, well, that's of course, I knew you were going to do this. I knew this is the action you were going to take. So obviously this is the, but it doesn't stop their love and their affection. You know, there's moments yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that are really, really sweet. Um, like, cause when Kaito's spark um, ignites and he ends up disappearing, um, he ends up leaving Aiko behind. And it's like, it mirrors the time that he left the palace before. And then we see him having a conversation years later. And she says, you wouldn't um, leave without saying goodbye. And it's like, uh, it says, um, this wasn't a um, question. This is a statement, you know, yeah. and this is the understanding that they still have, that you can still be really strongly, closely bonded to people and still have differenting ideologies, even if, because they're all working towards the same idea, right? Or at least they should be. They should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there isn't, there's a really good uh, balance <coughs> struck by Bowman here where they never make the Imperials out to be evil in any way. Like, regardless of how you feel, like, personally, listener at home or me and Nathan here, how we feel about ruling bodies and the idea of classism and being uh, blind to the imbalance in society if you are at a certain rung on the ladder, as it were. The Lightpaw, who is the kind of uh, the mouthpiece, I guess, for the Imperials throughout the story, the, the mentor of, of Kaito and Aiko, you never ever get a sense that Lightpaw is evil or malicious or mm. or even like um, ignorant. They are aware of the problems that are going on in Kamigawa and they are trying the best in the way that they think is best to dish out technology. What they don't want to happen is that unregulated, untested, and therefore dangerous technology ends up in the hands of the populace and the masses, therefore causing more problems than it solves. That's their whole thing, whilst Mm. also trying to balance the tradition and the history of the Kami, who are still like sentient beings on the plane of Kamigawa, and although the futurists like Kaiso, who even states uh, in one of the episodes that he never understands the idea of the Kami being revered as gods, once you see a Kami me relaxing in a mud pool like, oh yeah you know, got it's, that, it's hard got it's hard to think down. of them as a yeah. god right they become less like, ethereal i think they become less ethereal. Like, yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's exactly it that's so but, commonplace there's a cami of the dishwasher of dishwasher yeah exactly the, and there's like, like a cami of like food vendors and all this kind yeah. of thing but but at the same time like the imperials also do know and do understand that the kami are intrinsic to the very fabric of the plane and that the futurists mm. and the reckoners and the uprisers are maybe not seeing the picture beyond their own strife and it's and that is just if that isn't just the microcosm of all class warfare like right. obviously don't get me wrong i'm not an apologist yeah i'm not an apologist for ruling classes i mean fuck it, I'm from the fucking UK. Do you know what I mean? Like, if we know anything about class, like, you know, we are a country that knows about class and class divide. But, you know, within the story of Kamigawa, it's very, very clear that no one faction is deliberately trying to fuck the other one over. Mm. It's just the perspective of each faction is just so, like, is so blinded by the by how far they can see in front of them. Um, yeah. well, I guess this is why not having uh, the emperor around is really important, right? Because well, there's yeah, no yeah. single voice. And what we find out from the wanderer and what we see uh, within the um, within the story is that she has a very strong, deliberate, and 
cool headed voice like she's she's very um together like she's wise beyond her years um and and it, every it, clearly this is the problem with Camargo at the moment this is why the uprisers are so um, also have a kind of like to stand on is that without a voice an individual voice just having this gulf all it's doing is allowing the different factions to to kind of strengthen each other's differences right where you need that unification and when you lack that unification um it, it, a lot of things can go wrong like i would be surprised if we if i'd be surprised if if we did get um side stories that it didn't focus on the other on the effects of like the factionization of the other um clans we haven't seen like we'll probably get like an azumi one we'll definitely get an orochi one we'll definitely get an aki one we might see kind of like the effects of how technology has affected their developments in terms of like where they sit because i know the aki for example became like the blacksmiths as it were right they were really good at generating and, and coming up with all the new ideas but they didn't necessarily have the resources to refine them it seems like it's the soratami that are like the you know the i guess almost like the vidalkin kind of that feeling of like oh yeah. well, we're the blue artificy kind of clan as it were so obviously we you know you you do put the raw effort in but then we can refine it and add and, and add the you know the blue manner spin to things are very it has its efficiency and all that kind of nonsense so yeah, yeah. i mean it's all, it's all still gonna fit stories. into the fit into the color pie right it's also gonna fit into the color oh, pie. exactly um yeah yeah i mean let's let's talk about the wanderer because we've actually we, we have spoken about uh kaito quite a bit and i'm sure we'll, we'll come back to him but let's talk about the wanderer so the wanderer is a character that we've seen in magic story i mean was it was it war of the spark that they were introduced yeah uh, yeah yeah yeah. that was their first planeswalker card for sure anyway the, the uncommon one and then we got one card in a courier without any explanation which had the wanderer artwork on it just just there we go there we go they weren't in the story i mean it wouldn't have mattered if they were or they weren't like the story was completely different to what was on the cards anyway but Separate issue. Uh, and people had so many theories. They thought that maybe it was Emrakul. They thought it was maybe Elspeth. They had all this stuff going on. And I've seen oh, people man. on Twitter kind of slightly complaining that it wasn't one of these big fan theories that got, like, you know, revealed and all this kind of stuff. And all I've got to say to that is, is if every fandom listened to every fan theory and made it manifest, all fandoms would be fucking shit. Mm. Doesn't matter if you think your your one idea was good. It would have been nice that if if the wanderer turned out to em, be Emrakul, everyone would have gone like, "Oh, that's cool." Doesn't mean it's better or worse than the fact that the uh, the wanderer is the emperor of Kamigawa. That's pretty fucking cool. Mm-hmm. That's Do you big know what enough. I mean? And it's, it, also, it doesn't it doesn't eliminate another thing right if people there were some people saying like oh it might be elish norn it might be and i was like but don't you want those characters to have their own individual thing yeah. without it also being tied into i mean i know you this idea of bridging two things together to make like to make the two ideas cooler when you bring them together it's like well yeah but then you've kind of lost a whole other avenue of yeah. possibility like we still don't actually know what, what the wanderer has been doing for the last 10 years when she's been bouncing about like we might she could be doing any number of little side story kind of things that we can now go along to without having to be like well, how do we justify that it was also emrakul doing this you know and also you can have your like emrakul story still you can have your cake and eat it right by the end of the story we find out that you know tamia's got all these like you know these these scrolls and all this and she's yeah. kept her memory and she knows about she knows about Emrakul, so yeah, mm, you know that kind yeah. of idea, right? So, I mean, I don't think as much. I love, I love a fan theory. I'm a massive. You know, I mean, if you didn't know this by now, I'm a, a big fan of the. But you leaks, you the also tend to get theorists. you two do tend to get story beats pretty correct though. Like you were one of the very first people I ever like saw that just went, oh yeah, it's Emrakul. Like with shadows over in Strad, and I was like, "What?" And he said, "Oh, it's going to be Emrakul, and then this is going to happen, and that's going to happen." And that was months before I saw anyone else on Reddit. And I think you were one of like maybe like a hundred people on like the internet saying this, and then it all got caught up. I was like, "Oh, fucking hell!" Like you are pretty good at doing this kind of thing, much better than yeah. I am. Anyway. Well, I read a lot of people's opinions, and a lot of them are stupid, and some of them make sense, and they're the ones that I'm like, "Okay, this seems to make more sense if this happens." <laughs> it's like a collab. It's collaboration. You can work it out eventually. Sure. You're a good refiner. You're you're very you're very yeah, good about it. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh but i mean okay right so um wonder it in general it, w- w- one thing i will say is that it was really nice to almost like reverse engineer her story right of where okay yeah she's just a normal person but you get a little bit of her of her without getting a point of view of it's not her point of view that expands to your knowledge of her it's the point of view from other people right so you get to see sure. um kind of almost is, is she's still veiled for most of the story right she's there behind the screen door which she's speaking with kaito she's still quite reserved when they even meet face to face there's only like a few breaks she still has an air of mystery about her but from what you get from her she's you know you get this idea of strength and loyalty and a real like I, I, she's 
um what's the word i'm gonna look for, um, i'm looking for um reliable there's something really like reliable and like wholesome about and now we've lost one really wholesome reliable character like tamia that whenever you see him in a story you go oh okay it's gonna be it might be okay like as you say <laughs> The wonder bounced in, slashed the shit out of uh, Ginger Taxi as without breaking a beat. Like this, this, this she's great. Like she's fantastic. Well, fantastic. Is, I mean, apart, yeah, like, go ahead. I was gonna say, apart from her like inability to stay in one place, which I hope does get fixed, even though it is a nice kind of foil to her power, right? Of where you need to balance this. She's basically one punch man at this point. It feels like, and it's like okay, so you need the foil, the way that kind of balances her out a little bit, and also keeps her interesting, and how they're gonna fix that, and probably builds up a nice climax to. She's probably gonna off Tezzer or something, and that kind of finish that little arc as well um, yeah but yeah i mean again i, I just like the I, I don't normally like flashbacky kind of stories and a lot of the stories in recent magic time has been like flashbacky stories but this one felt like it was earned um it felt like it worked quite nicely um and it, it kind of broke the pace up of the main story which is just a to b b to a a to c c to a a to b b to, and it, once that got broken up a little bit it actually you know didn't feel quite well, do you so know what exhausting. the reason so I'll talk a little bit about the Wonder in just a second, but the thing, like the reason I think that it worked so fluidly in this story, whereas previously it, it was maybe a little bit harsher, is because if you look at um, and this is again, I'll say it again, all of the things I'm saying that are good about this story, I'm not necessarily saying I'd want to replace these things in other stories. Each story arc and each plane deserves to have its own style of storytelling, and each author obviously needs to be lauded for the story type of story that they tell. But the way that this succeeded, maybe more than so others did. It's because if you look at the uh, Innistrad stories, where we were looking, having flashbacks of uh, Arlen Cord's uh, life as a werewolf with Tovalar, although it, ref- although it mattered for the story in terms of Tovalar was a character that she was having to deal with in the present, and then you were having flashbacks of her time with Tovalar in the past, it wasn't one narrative. That it was a different time in her life that the result of which informed where she is now. Whereas with Kaito and the Wanderer and Aiko, it's all one narrative. The story starts when Kaito meets the Wanderer or the Empress. Do you know what I mean? That's when mm. his story starts, and hers, essentially. They form a friendship, she disappears. He spends all that time trying to find her, and then she comes back and like the events of the present-day story unfolds. But it's all one narrative. It's the story of these two friends. And so jumping backwards and forwards, like in either within episodes or between episodes, where we start off one episode ten years before or after the previous one started or ended, it doesn't feel like we're kind of going, oh, why are we seeing this random ass memory about him being upset with his friend about something? That doesn't really reference what's going on now. It is one story, and we're just telling it in a non-linear way, which is a which is a technique as old as storytelling, you know. Yeah, yeah. I guess also you're trying to link in a lot of different like parts of history, right? Because there is a few different things that have that have, that have happened at different points. Like, because I guess that was the thing that I thought was a bit tricky was um the where did put that put Tezzer if it was ten years ago that he was doing the original prototype, and I, at first I thought it it felt a little bit ham fisted the way the Tezzer were kind of slotted in, and by the end of the story I ended up kind of really turning around and being like, actually, this is a really nice way to tie everything in together. And as much as I said I don't like it when you put two really interesting things in the plot together, sometimes you need that coalescence to kind of make everything have a bit, as I say, a bit more weight and a bit more um, validity. And it's quite nice that we're able to kind of. Sp- also swing in this idea that Tezzer probably had this idea right from New Phyrexia, right? So he's already yeah. kind of collaborating with uh, New Phyrexia anyway, and then the whole shit happens with Agents of Artifice, and then he gets picked up and re- reconfigured by Nicol Bolas. We see it in that web comic of where it's like, you know, I've got my new toy to play with, Sarkin, and it's Tezzer in a mm. fucking, you know, chamber being reconstructed, and then everything leading, leading up to War of the Spark happened. And then now he's basically the exact same position he was in before, but, uh, but now Bolas is dead, so he doesn't have to worry about him. And now he's got a planar portal, which is kind of the one thing the planes, the, the fractions really needed. And I yeah. kind of like now that you kind of feel like in the back, there was always this progression, right? There was always this stuff going on and always working. And the fact that none of the main story, apart from a little bit of um, uh, in cow time, like apart from that little bit where she battles him a little bit, like Warren Clicks otherwise could have got, got away with being involved in that story completely with no one knowing anything about it. And sure. that was kind of nice for the first one. Everyone was like, oh, okay, then what are they doing? Why are they here? And then they took the tie right. And now they didn't explain how Jinder Taxi is, is, is on Kamigawa. We just have to kind of assume that, well, it, Warren Klex was kind of on Kaldheim and he kind of got the tie right elixir. And, that, and the, obviously that's all about like how the gods can change between realms. So maybe that's how, well, how Jinder the... Taxi can come over here. 
in the epilogue of the Kaldheim stories, we do have Tezzeret there. We just don't. It's not stated that it's Tezzeret. It's it's alluded to that Tezzeret's in league with the Phyrexians, which I think is something we kind of gloss over in this story and haven't mentioned because it was just if you have it's if you have any given, knowledge, right? it's just like it's a given. It's Tezzeret. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. But it's just it's nice to see that this idea of Phyrexianized planeswalkers. I mean, talk about fan theories that have paid off. Like for ages, not only us but lots of other people have been saying. Well, the Phyrexians are going to be trying to do their own little gay watch. They want planeswalkers. Nicol Bolas wanted planeswalkers. They're like they're the hot shit. If you want to rule the multiverse, you've got to have these mages who can bounce around and do all kinds of crap. So what have we not seen yet? We've not seen a dark gate watch. Or well, that's what the Phyrexians are doing. And that's exactly what they're doing. There was that little hint of it in uh in Kaldheim again when in the Tybalt story in episode three of that of that arc where he talks yeah. about having the seed of Phyrexia the seed, being planted. Yeah, and we don't know for sure if that's been just made inert, if it's still there, whether it can still be activated. Another experiment, I mean, I... well quite, yeah. Right, we're not sure. So I mean this is the other thing, right, is that complicated is a keyworded ability. Mm. Is that means it's going to be on other planeswalkers? This is this we're going to have a Tibalt be... planes. We're going to have a Tibalt Phyrexian planeswalker easily. Yeah. Um, That's there's a work. nice cool theory about Calix because he's a planeswalker designed uh, to to chase planeswalkers and find planeswalkers. Sure. So oh, that's right. like the white black one, and then people. Uh, it, there's, there's, there's a shit. There's shit. Well, there's would he be, would he be white black, or would he retain being white green? Well, I think the idea is he would stay. They keep the color right now because faction is all colors, right? That's the idea now, right? Yeah. I mean, okay, red faction kind of like peeled off a little bit, but for all intents and purposes, Elish is kind of at the, at the top. Then it's blue and green, and then black kind of a little bit behind them because Shieldred right again don't really know exactly what's happened with her. Um, but the the view and the message we seem to get from Frexia is about solidarity, right? So it's one of these ideas that. I think they would just allow the colours to remain and give kind of, I think the new the, the new Phyrexia needs to be all, all of the colours. But I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I like this idea that we're probably over the next couple of years going to see, as you say, this build up of the, the dark the dark watch, as it were. Um, I think this is all going to key up to Elish Norm becoming, an, uh, becoming a Phyrexian Planeswalker Praetor. Like, I think that's kind of where it's likely to go if, if yeah. cliche kind of story arcs go. Because I mean, other than that, I don't really know what other White Walkers you can do. I really hope they don't do I mean, Koth is kind of a given. He's been on for New Phyrexia for a long time. Hopefully he, they don't, because that kind of is like the one thing fighting against Phyrexia. If he's still going, then good God, that guy lifts, because <laughs> it's been a long time that then we just left him alone and been like, ah, Koth will be fine. And, you know, but like, this is the idea is you've given us a Tamiya that's completed now you've actually got proper stakes and now you've got agency across um, multiple planes and again you don't give us this big exposition exp- explanation of how it's all happened we kind of just have to but it's not even if we have to assume everything's gonna be okay we just need to know and understand now that everything is not okay nothing is well safe. No. do you know so there was a lot of discourse uh when the stories dropped of people um who this is such a classic magic player thing and i, I don't think this was necessarily malicious whinging but it was definitely whinging to a degree of people being like no what have they done to tamio it's kind of unnecessarily cruel don't you think we get to see her family and then they make her complicated like oh my god like give it a rest wizards like and i just sort of think no 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 no. you need to show that the phyrexians are hard fucking bastards and what mm-hmm. better way than to have a fan favorite planeswalker who we finally get to meet their family with a cute adopted rat son to boot who is then at the end of the story like frexianized and not just like completed like at the end of the story the language used to describe tamio's uh phyrexian thought, thought process is not it's not something like she's robotic and evil like her inner monologue is exactly the same as when she was regular Tamio. She it's describes so about how she would do she would do anything for her family. She loves her family and she mm-hmm. would do like anything to see them succeed. Phyrexia is now her family and she yeah. would do anything to see them succeed. It's and you're like, yeah. yeah. Just full fast and furious. It's yeah. all about family now, bitches. And the fact is that this the thing she goes, she looks at the scroll she said she would never use. And then and then and then it goes, but she would do anything for Phyrexia. It's like, oh for fuck oh my god, they're yeah, really not those playing iron around it. scrolls that she didn't yeah. even really use against Emrakul. And now she's like, oh well I guess I've got that Phyrexian uh, well, if I had to. Yeah, fuck yeah. it. Why not? I had to, for the sake of Phyrexia. What's in those like... fucking scrolls, man? Mm-hmm. What's in the scroll? What's in the scroll? <laughs> What's in the scroll? And it's so it is just so unnerving. Yeah, that there's doesn't there was no resistance, right? What the only way they kind of put it, and this is really good. We haven't really kind of spoken about this specifically, but the language, the language used in these stories is amazing. It's such a joy to read. Like it's it's got such a nice quality to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it says right at the end, um, um, the line, oh, 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 God. 
one second. Um, that she. Da-da-da. Where are you? Epilogue. There we go. Uh, Tammy eyes fluttered at the sound of Ginger Saxon's voice. She sat up, processing the shapes around her. It wasn't the first time she'd been awake in the laboratory, but it was the first time that it felt familiar. Ooh. It's like, oh, you've come round like time and time again, probably in yeah. absolute agony and distress. Yeah. It doesn't even go into any of it. It's the same kind of thing with the Essica, like, the Essica epilogue um, in Cow Time. I was like, this is like kind of the most like horror even magic site kind of felt in a long time of where it doesn't really explicitly state things it kind of just hints at it and like and, and the, the way they do it and the way they present the corrections has been is, it has had like significant like fear factor kind of they've kind all of been in the shadows they've been in the yeah. shadows which is crazy for something that's like a whole nation of these extroverted like death robots like do you know what i mean and they've all been in the fucking shadows because mm. no we've known for, for years right because we've known oh new phyrexia we just left the plane being the new phyrexia and we're like and then this is like we're just not going to put them in any of the stories for like four or five years well, yeah, this, do this and all the authors are like losing their minds it's like oh no no they always have been it's just it's only now that you're starting to notice it's only now that they're being bold enough to be able to be in the limelight and if they're being bold enough to be in the limelight you know you should be shitting your pants because that's not a good place to be well this confirms exactly what we said about kaya from the innistrad stories remember at the very end of our story review for innistrad and indeed at the very end of those stories we were questioning why what why wasn't kaya grabbing teferi by his beard being like the fucking phyrexians were on kaldheim and it's like because she doesn't know what a phyrexian no. is she, she just doesn't know the doesn't even look yeah, doesn't and he doesn't even look is. like made, made of metal. Like, he was a furry bony dude. Didn't so even look at made out of metal. We have Kaito like dropping in on Jin Cataxius, and he doesn't go, "Holy fucking shit, you're one of those Phyrexians that all my planeswalker buddies keep talking about." <laughs> He's just like, "Oh, you're like a metal monster. That's kind of weird. What the fuck are you?" And like, like again, like I, I've said on this uh, podcast many a time. And indeed, I've bored my friends, such as you, many a time when I've been drunk about how much I fucking hate dramatic irony in, like, storytelling. Especially on TV, right? Like, you're screaming at the screen, like, that you know something important, that the dumbass mm-hmm. protagonist is going, oh, well, I'm going to trust my best friend, who's so obviously the fucking serial killer, or whatever the hell it is, right? But the dramatic irony used in this instance, where the, the characters don't know something because it's so natural not to know something, because the multiverse is literally infinite... So if you're telling these big infinite stories, you can have these villains that are huge at one point been out of existence for just long enough that they can resurge again. And that's why the Phyrexians are so dangerous. That's why they'll mm. never be defeated unless it's with a concerted effort by, again, probably every known planeswalker. And then we'll have like War of the Spark Round 2. You know, do you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, Electric Boogaloo. Yeah. I guess the other thing that kind of works to their favor is that there is this multiversal transparency, right? That now it just seems to be that everyone, especially like Strixhaven and our, um, and, um, blah, 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 uh, Kabagawa. It, it's very much like people know of other planes now. It's, it's just yeah, common knowledge. Yeah, they keep referencing I mean, it to most, most planes. The plane. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a lot of planes seem to know about other planes. There are a few that say like, maybe like a courier that won't have as much awareness because they're not that advanced. Again, it's the technological advancement kind of thing, right? You get to a certain point in your development as a, as a plane, be it, you know, through, um, um, fucking uh, Ravnica and being an entire metropolis um, and yeah. being multicultural or being like your centre of or being the centre of the multiverse like Dominaria or having enough technology to advance yourself using portals or you know that kind of idea of like there are certain planes that will just naturally have that awareness and that connection um, and and it, now that there is this just very thin veil like the new world order like rule doesn't seem to really matter if we're oh you can't know if we go to another plane they can't know that we're from another plane it might break everything we'll just be revered as gods so that doesn't really seem to matter anymore which kind of gives for actions almost like an out because it's not as you say so bizarre when you see this monstrosity or monster like you see like well this guy's clearly from off world this guy's clearly from yeah. off world he goes to tamio's yeah, yeah, place yeah. sees a picture in the back of a wall and goes oh you're a planeswalker then you know and it's like okay cool there is a little bit of like well both kaito and the wanderer were like friends as as kids and they both turned out to be planeswalkers and how 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 many people have sparks these days you know apart from well, that i was little, i was really worried quip. that they were going to suggest that kaito had a spark and I was about to be like, ah, oh, fucking hell, how many brother sister like spark teams do we need in the multiverse? Thankfully they didn't do that, which I yeah. think then made their relationship that much better. But also mm. to kind of hook it back around to the Wanderer, because I kind of I I got excited talking about Phyrexians, like when has anyone ever said that? <laughs> um but I like to talk about the Wanderer. Something which I was really impressed with the Wanderer that I, I started this story of two two my two things with the Wanderer. Firstly, I was like, what are the fucking chances that both Kaito and his buddy, who happens to be the Emperor of Kamigawa, 
both have sparks and then they both fuck off like pretty much like within a year of each other they both get their sparks mm. ignited through the storytelling of no the reason they have their sparks ignited are directly linked it's not just some like random thing she has her spark ignited not only just like because it was her time to but because it was a forced thing by another more experienced planeswalker so that's already like a fairly nice way to do it yeah who probably didn't even know uh, that, that she that, that no, she uh, was a Kyodai, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there was no way he would have known that kyodo was linked with an emperor who happened to have a spark he just wanted yeah. to go after the, the biggest kami so that was already interesting enough but the only reason that his spark gets ignited is because he comes into contact with the kami of the spark who is only in existence because of the fact that yeah. Emperor's spark ignited. Like it is, it's it that's is actually more enough. believable, right? It's that much more believable, believable than oh, you happen to nearly die, and then you also happen to be a planeswalker. Well, or like, or like or half the spark. fucking like yeah, half the like populace of Ravnica seem to have fucking latent sparks. You know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, we're all just knocking around with them. But so that was number one. The second thing is that I was like, oh, as much as obviously War of the Spark is a few years ago now, and people have been dying to know what the fuck's going on with this Wanderer character. When they did the art reveal, for example, of the Planeswalker card for the Wanderer, and we saw her face, I was like, "Oh well, they've ruined it." Like that was the coolest thing about the Wanderer. <laughs> like, and they've and that literal that like three centimeters of her head that we never saw covered by her cool hats. Like that was the coolest thing about her. Fucking rah 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 rah. rah. And actually, I'm totally wrong. Not only did they not reveal her name, not give away anything about her character, only gave her more mysterious background. She's actually leaving this story with more like uh, mystique than she entered it because now mm. we know just enough about her to be like the f- the fucking wonder is even more badass than we could have ever thought. Yeah. And now but I want to know more. Her spark's not fixed. We don't know her name, and the very intrinsic nature of the fact that uh, they say it in the story, the fact that she sparked when she was a child, as many planeswalkers do but then had to live in the existence of only spending a random amount of time on any one plane and binning around. Her actual like uh, persona and her actual personality is one of the Wanderer. It's not, it, she's not the Wanderer because we as the audience don't know who she is. She barely fucking knows who she is because mm. this is the only existence she's ever known. Like, she yeah. is the Wanderer. You can't change that by revealing her face or by being like, well, this is who she was. Like, her as a character now has not been damaged at all. And that's an amazing thing to pull off, I feel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's almost felt, it's almost as like as, um, it's the opposite almost of um, Sark and, um, oh, Unbroken, right? If we go almost like that, he had that culmination moment. It's almost like the Wanderer can also have that in the future as well, right? If that moment of where it's like, whatever her name actually is, complete or whatever, you know, or the, the finally settled or the retired or whatever they want to fucking call it, call it to make it a funny pun. Um, but yeah, like there'll be a time I think that we'll see that her, her coalesce and then she'll be even stronger and more powerful than before. And it'll be like, oh, you know, like I like that idea of, of a Trump, like a, a Trump that, that kind of can can give a finality to a character that is, as you say, still got plenty to be interested about. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, really cool. Very cool. Can we there's also a, quickly a... say... How yeah, much more on. interesting? No, is, was that more about the Wanderer? Only, only. So, there's <laughs> my my favorite line in this whole story arc is uh, it's where Kaito and the Wanderer finally get a moment to kind of talk to each other about the fact that Kaito has been bidding around the multiverse for the past decade to find her, and the Wanderer says, "It's so funny." Uh, I obviously heard about the Kamigawan planeswalker looking for their lost emperor, so I knew you were out there looking for me, and at times I was only ever a step behind you. And it's that realisation, the next paragraph, they go on to the Kaito's realisation of going, not only was I looking for her, she was looking for me. Mm-hmm. And again, two characters who we've never met before suddenly have a complete ten year long backstory that fits in to the entire multiverse like a jigsaw piece. Super fucking cute, right? It's like, a, it's like something out of it's like your name, right? It's like fucking your name. It's, it's just so so cute. It's so I do find good. I also find it's of course like a romantic comedy, right? Of this idea of where like there's this Kamigawa and Planeswalker bouncing around the multiverse and somehow it's so like 
unusual that it's, it's been passed around. Ever remembers it. I'm like, it's just because of it. So it's, it's not like farcical. It does. It's quite amusing to me. This idea that the it's fun, was... but it's good. But all those times that people were like, oh, we can have these random cards per set where the wanderer just kind of bins in and bins out again. Wouldn't that be funny? And now not only is it funny, but it actually has a reason. We know what she mm-hmm. was doing. She was trying to find Kaito. Can what? we just for the next three years just have Kaito and the Wanderer just keep like in alternating sets, or, yeah, or yeah, be like, yeah, yeah, or you'll yeah. see Kaito at the beginning of the sto- of the story of the plane, and then you'll see the Wanderer at the end. You're like, oh, they missed each other again. Oh no. Well, if they if they ever do that the thing next five with, to ten years, uh, they do that thing which they did with um, Colossal Dreadmore between the two Ixlan sets where they had the same card, but we just do that and they have different flavor texts. Whereas in the yeah, first it's one, just, it's quite and, of Kaito. It, and then there's like the Wanderer. Wanderer. Yeah. <laughs> That's so have much, you seen oh, Have you seen a woman with a wide brimmed hat? And then, like next yeah. card, you have the same like card, and it's like, have you seen this dude with a shaved head and a tanuki? And you're like, oh yay! Yeah, it's fantastic. You just you see, and one of them's running in one direction um, in the artwork, and the other one's running in the other direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the, in the artwork, oh, stunning. I love it. Beautiful. Like we we don't we don't deserve Bowman in, in this game. Like no, they've done such, a good, such job. a good job. Also, yeah. how much better is this brother sister relationship than the twins? Uh, I don't want to. I mean, I don't want to shit on the Kenriths, but they are not likable. <laughs> you know what I mean? Is it like the, they're just not the, the specific the specific relationship of a brother and sister? Like I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an only child, so I can't necessarily relate. But sure. um, it does feel so much more wholesome. It feels so much more nice to have like a grounded, not whiny teen kind of thing. Which they could have very easily done with another with young characters again, right? The cast is quite young. Well, the the dynamic is the same in terms of that you have the bookish one who wants to play by the rules, and you have the impulsive one who wants to do their own thing. The difference is is that these two, Kaito and uh, and Aiko, love each other and trust that the other one has their best interests at heart at all times, mm. whereas Will and Rowan think the other one's a piece of shit <laughs> and that neither of them are in any way redeemable with their constant bickering. <laughs> Ugh, my brother, yuck, so gross. Yeah, right? oh, my it sister's is... a complete twat. Oh, well, yeah, I guess great. it's the difference between orphans story. orphans, and prince and princesses, oh, right? I guess well, that's, I mean, there, that's there, their <laughs> characterization, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a and big difference twins. there already. There is a very big <laughs> yeah. difference. So I'm like, again, yeah. I don't want to just shit all over the Kenrys, but yes, no. as a there reading is, yeah. experience... The dynamic is so much more pleasing. It's much nicer. <laughs> yeah, it's much nicer yeah. to read about Taiko and and uh, Kaito and Aiko rather than Will and Rowan because Will and Rowan mm. fucking suck, and they need to get the f- they need like Professor Onyx to like you know get them writing lines like I promise not to treat my sister like a dickhead. I promise not to treat my brother like a dickhead, and just do that for, like hours and hours and hours. Mm. Um, yeah. 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 I think the other big thing as well is that the story managed to fin- end with a massive climax and big ramifications without destroying the plane. You know, like the plane yes, is, isn't for fixed. Once. And nothing's, nothing's, nothing's like fixed. There's still like lots of unrest, right? And I feel like that's yes. fine. That's prime to come back to again because we haven't, we didn't see a lot of the, the spirity side of it, of Kamigawa. It was very much like kind of nestled within this kind of like f- the future. I mean, I guess we will see when the full set's released. We're in like 130 odd cards or something spoiled at this rate. So we haven't seen the full set. Um, and probably we will still get other stories. I'm hoping that we get at least a story of like you know that's outside of Ijan- um, Ijango and a, a one that's um, in the Orochi. I wouldn't mind seeing another like a green ace sort yeah, of story. Yeah, we, we didn't see anything of the Orochi, and we didn't see anything of the. We got a little bit of Zoom. No we didn't Oni. see any of the uh, Oni Aki. or of the Aki. There we go. That's what I'm trying to. Yeah, there we go. So. Yeah, there's quite a few that we can still kind of get a nice slice that will give even a bit more breadth to Kamigawa. The kind of like, yeah, it's I feel like it's, it's it? been a very satisfying visit. I feel like they they played it just enough safe with the design. I mean, I say when I say safe, is in they put a massive amount of effort of making sure that they they got it right. You know, there wasn't there's not a lot of rocking the boat here, um, from what I can see. And they're doing some weird things. You know, like the reality chip is a is a, a legendary artifact in creature jellyfish equipment. What? Right, so we'll we'll talk about this. I mean, those are so we're getting onto like what's on the card. Yeah, now, yeah. We'll talk about yeah. this in our flavor picks. But yes, they are doing some incredibly interesting things. Um, I've got a question. I'm just going to ask you a question, and mm. I just want you to give your intri- your instinctive intrinsic, your instinctive yes or no answer. Has this cyberpunk sci-fi set ruined Magic: The Gathering? Well, of course not. Well, then but, can we all just shut the fuck yeah, up and move on with our lives? This then? is the, th- the biggest thing about these things, right? Is that even if it had, I mean, like, again, not even if it had, like, 
even if you really really don't like the specific style and like specific swing i've seen pushback against a lot of things even little things like how the art, art style for the samurais and the um, ninjas is a bit too you know mangafied and that kind of thing I'm like, i get i can understand why people don't have an aversion to specific art styles even if it is an alternate art style so the other art that you get in the set is already just normal kamigawa okay it's yeah. a bit brighter and a bit poppier and all that nonsense mechs this is the urza's argument urza was wandering around in, in power suits and power mechs yeah. like years and years and years ago and even if it did and does really irk you to the point where you don't want to engage with it thankfully stories are now so concise that you don't miss out too much all you do is have a bit more money for the, for the next set right so yeah. i i can understand why from a visual point of view like and it's funny because i don't even feel like it's the same people that are like you've ruined kamigawa they say you've just ruined magic i'm like but but can you not see the, you're not seeing the wood for the trees here they managed to fix kamigawa yeah, and without ruining it, you know, they fixed it without ruining it. It feels feel, still feels enough like old Kamigawa, while still having this kind of massive, massive swing left field. Like you know, they managed to do the thing of futurism and traditionalism in a set. Uh, and again, if you don't like it, fucking whatever. What am I? Forty seven, forty forty k. Sorry, on the fucking horizon. It's too late. <laughs> Get I, on board. <laughs> at no point. And I mean, I, I mean, I'm biased. I mean, I'm biased for two reasons. Firstly, I'm a big sci fi fan, and secondly, mm. I was never of the opinion that. Or at least certainly not recently. That I'm sure someone will find a soundbite from like episodes one to like fifty of me being like, you know, well I want to keep my sci-fi and my fantasy separate. Because I think that is maybe something that when I first started playing the game, I would not have disagreed with completely. But especially of recent, I've not been someone who's been like, Why are they doing cyberpunk and Kamigawa? That's ridiculous. And certainly reading this story is at no point did I not believe that modern day Kamigawa was part of the multiverse. Even mm-hmm. with the idea that at exactly the same time that we have Neon Dynasty, we also have Amonkhet, where people are literally living in a caravan, like, you know, trying to traverse an endless dead doom. <laughs> oh my scene. god, my, my brain just went to, like, like the, the other type of caravan, and I was like, what the fuck? That's the... Just imagining, like, Shameless by Amonkhet version. <laughs> oh no, 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 a caravan. Yeah, no, like, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, at exactly the same time that we have, like, Kaito, like, you know, eating like this deep fried crab like street food whilst like his tanuki drone flies to him and he like touches mm. a chip in his head and he's able to see through its eyes and then he has like a little boom like a little holographic thing pop up and he's got a job from the reckoners to go and like find this new guy and steal his technology whilst all this is going on you know you've got some poor fucking dude who's being attacked by a zombie like in a in a desert you know just trying to fight for his fucking life because his gods got destroyed by a dragon emperor you know these things are all happening at exactly the same time and then in another mm. part of like the multiverse a fisherman is literally sitting in the middle of a boat and then he gets enveloped by an eldritch sea god as he gets pulled down to the depths <laughs> do you know what i mean like all these things happening at once and at no point am i sat there being like well this is just ridiculous it's magic mm. the gathering it's a fucking mm. multiverse it's like not the get first on metal board plane. It's, it's not, not, the not first even metal the most plane. metal ma- it's not even the most it's not metal even plane. the most metal plane <laughs> like tezzer literally tech- is like oh, yeah tezzer it's like literally kind of almost like the example of this right of where he's almost like you can, it's, uh, this is why I said a bit about the uh, how look out any planes in the future have any metal attached to them. It's, it's when he says like you rely so much on on technology that I've already mastered, and it's not that he's just mastered. For him, it's probably like bejazzling, right? He looks at because he comes from a plane where Ethereum is like a living like a living metal, right? You can like almost yeah. like you can you can become part of your body. You know, he knows about Mirrodin where it was like a living like a, the entire plane was metal. You know, like there wasn't a single creature that wasn't metal in some fashion. And then he comes to this place where it's all glitz and glamour modifications. So to him, it's all probably like child's playing in comparison to like the intrinsic um, um, uh, fucking incorporation that other planes have with metal. Like so, it's not. I understand why because I guess you've got the like the 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 analog right the modern day in like like Earth analog of where you look at neon signs and things like that and you're like okay I can understand why you might think that that's too much of a a human Earth real world like analog but most planes are based on our history yeah. so why can't we also have some planes that take on some of our current and potential future well it's work? that is that classic thing of I think I've I've referenced referenced it before but there's that uh, classic episode of uh, Office Hours with uh, the professor on Tony Community College uh, Office Hours being the the kind of the skit series where he's a college professor where his students are planeswalkers and he has like back and forth of them and he's got um Garrick in his office and Garrick's talking about how he wants to collapse society and society is really bad and evil and uh, <laughs> the prof goes but you've got an axe he goes yeah he goes, cool, an axe that was forged in a forge. Yeah. A forge that can only exist because of society. Well, 
yeah. And you're like, well, this is just the same argument. It's just the same argument again mm-hmm. and again and again. Like, you know, there's there is absolutely room in Magic the Gathering for sci-fi. Is there room in fantasy for sci-fi? I think that's a different argument. Magic the it's Gathering argument. is called a fantasy card game because that's the most recognisable genre it fits into. It isn't just a fantasy card game. It's a card game with a multiverse, and some of those mm. universes are sci-fi, and some of them are fantasy. And one in the future is going to be fucking cowboy related. So get used to it. <laughs> yeah, like our big one of our biggest bads is metal based Borg. They're Borg. They're and Borg. That, like when well, we did it for like years, and it was fine, and that didn't ruin magic. That was like some of the best magic. I mean, like don't get me wrong, there's as as a saga kind of ruined the game for a bit. But that's fine. You know. Like, <laughs> Like we've already done that before. We've already done the metal and the sci-fi and the, and the body horror, and it's like, well, well, of course we could do it again, and we can do other things that also aren't like, yeah, like, yeah. I just don't see. I understand the distaste that it can have even people's mouth, but I don't understand how it can make you boycott um, a game that's arguably offering too much. You know, it's too much yeah. in a year to engage with, and now it's almost they're going. You know what? We're not only going to make it way too much; we're going to make some of them undesirable, so you don't have to engage. So again, if you're just smacking your head against the wall, going, "Why don't I? Li- why can't I like this?" Then stop trying to like it, and then don't worry about that. It's not going to stop the making sets that you're going to like in the future. You know, if you don't like Neon Dynasty, you're going to really probably, or you're probably not going to like the Brothers Walks. That's also mechs. But that's from like seven thousand years ago. You're probably also not going to oh, like Nick <laughs> Well, yeah, and at that point, do you even like Magic? Then at that point, but then, but, I get, like, like, but if- like, like, do you remember the days like when we? had like three set blocks and some people were like i just don't really like tark here and so they just didn't yeah. they just didn't engage with the game for like they, d- they, didn't, get, they didn't get a year they had to go do it like a year exactly and we have like yeah. had sets like oh drain you know and they've we, again with getting kamigawa right it kind of shows that even the planes that you really like that you think we might not see again more more than likely going to go back again like if you don't like if you liked lawwin and you thought well i mean lawwin's not going to work they did they fixed kamigawa if they fix kamigawa they can do anything so sure. again, again, it's just a shade. It's just putting that dial really far up to the right in terms of like what we can get away with in terms of like futuristic, futuristic kind of stuff, and still yeah. making it fantasy esque. Like mechs, yeah. okay, you know they look a bit Gundam-y, but at the same time, well, so the in terms of weaponry, it's funny. Like they were, everything was all Kami, either like Kami the channelers, so they had like they're basically like superheroes. Or you had like swords and mech and drones and things, but they're all very much like blade based. You still had to like hit mm. someone with a sword. The yeah, only it's folded metal, right? Folded metal. It's all origami based. The only exceptions that I saw were like very almost there, and then they got defeated very easily. It was on the mechs. You had the dragon mech who had like something charging in its mouth, and it was like basically going to like throw like a laser beam, like a dragon mech, and then that's get defeated by the wanderer. And then there was a like a, a lizard mech. That was the one that they crash land into a Ganja one in the fifth story that had quote unquote projectile based objects on its shoulders. And you're like, oh, mm. missiles. So it had rocket launches. But they just didn't quite say that in the story. And they were never used and they were very easily defeated even anyway. So, like, yeah, it's funny how they did have yeah. them there, but they just, swords are just as, as effective as laser beams, guys. Like, it's fine. <laughs> if anything, I think laser beams are more magic than guns are. Um, sorry, well, sure. And they have are, had like, laser beams in the past as well. So, yeah, yeah, like the whole point of like reg- regular technology is bits of metal wel- welded together. Like, that's so much more like less fantasy than like lasers and that kind of because that's like the magic-y side like i mean i think this is a really good example of like why the arcade why arcane did so well because it did this fusion of kind of like old school new school right of where where does magic and technology kind of really not quite and maybe this is why it would be really good if now that we know camera girl is successful and i feel like for the most part it will be successful unless the limited format or, or standard format ends up being an absolute mess is that they can then now go back and do the next set there of a real investigation of how this technology works and how they can then delve in and go look most people didn't like the fact we did something sciencey right and we go right well let's go back and reinforce how it's actually the camis that are fueling this and that interaction between because that's the big another big thing that never got fixed is we didn't solve any uh, any of the underlying issues between the mortals and the cami and this keep this this thing about the merge gates being on the horizon kind of shows that there is a big foreshadowing potential story to come back to of, of how that that this was a problem this technology and they could then still wreck on the technology out of the plane again if they needed to but they yeah. might as well try these things because i feel like it creates opportunity not only artistically but also thematically and if it works it works if people really don't like it they respond to it fine but i feel like as a set it pops really well and i feel like a lot of the cards and the, and the art styles they're using are going to be massively lauded by some people and again if you don't like them just stick with the normal artwork which seems to be for the most part no less egregious than kaladesh 
No, I don't exactly. remember that having too much issue beyond you know energy being a mechanic. That's a mechanical thing, not a story or a design thing. I feel like yeah, we got sure. away with that, so we should be able to get away with this. Cool. Well, I think that's gonna kind of do it for us then, because we're we've started moving away from the story and are just kind of almost talking about the f- cards and the flavor because they have started being spoiled and we have been seeing them, uh, and I'm really excited to talk about them, and I'm really excited to talk about them now in a space where we already know the story and already know the world because now we can be like because mm. although although to be honest to be like full disclosure we never really recorded our story apps or our um flavor pick apps without there being some crossover like we usually had read a few stories or knew the world building when we did our flavor picks episodes so we could accurately be like well we feel like these cards are good and these cards are not good for the flavor or whatever but i think in terms of us being excited and invested in the idea of what some of these mechanics are going to be and in some of like the artwork especially like some of it mm. in a vacuum seems very like oh okay maybe this doesn't actually look like magic but having read the stories and being like oh no fucking get over yourself this is about as magic as it comes we can now look at the cards and be like hell yeah i love this artwork and this art style give me the guy with the fucking flaming mech suit who's like doing dj turntables like yeah fucking hell that's magic the gathering oh, i forgot you know? that's gonna be a card oh yeah, <laughs> yeah <gonna> <laughs> i mean that is a little bit extra but it, it works, is very it works now it works yeah. now i understand who it is and why they're doing it um and it will be interesting to see the legendary creatures as well if they do do all of the legendary creatures from the story which they might not it is yet to be seen how close the story is to the cards but we're just seeing it from the other side now so there we go um yeah. cool all right well listeners let us know what you thought of uh the kamigawa neon dynasty story let us know what you thought as well of uh, akemi dawn bowman uh, who I believe is a relatively new addition to the uh, Magic the Gathering story uh, team, uh, as I can see. Yep, yep, they've only ever done the Kamigawa stories, so there we go. Um, let us know if you enjoyed the story, who your favourite characters were. Uh, let us know if you thought it was worth giving uh, Kaito uh, telekinesis as a power, as it was referenced. Oh, that's funny, yeah. Three times. Why, Why also, yeah... <laughs> It's just, and it, it never justified it. Weird, it was just like, it? oh, also I've got telekinesis, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine, fuck All it, right. whatever, yeah, sure, fine. <laughs> God, everyone, everyone can just throw things with their minds these days. Tamio, oh, yeah, you're telepathic, yeah, fuck it, whatever. Everyone yeah, can whatever. have everything. <laughs> Kamigawa. <laughs> <laughs> Magic. Uh, let, let us know. Let us know via our Twitter at MT Flavoring. Emails go to mtflavoring at gmail dot com. Oh, my cold is really getting into my nose now. Uh, my personal Twitter is at Andy Manface. Nathan's, yours is... At the Fox in the Main. Excellent. Uh, and yeah, next time we talk to you guys, we will uh, probably be talking about our flavor picks. We haven't done a world-building episode because this is technically a returning uh, plane. We don't always do world-building for the returning planes, even though, I mean, for all intents and purposes, this is a brand new Kamigawa. Um, I just kind of feel like you will get the story... Through the story, you will get the world building. There's still a few things which I think could be expanded on, uh, and maybe in our Flavor Picks episodes, we'll link some articles that can maybe help you for the world building. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if you haven't read the story and you do just listen to episodes like this or from other current uh, content creators, such as people like Tulare Community College or the Porthos cast, um, I would really, really recommend actually reading the prologue and then episodes one to five uh, because you won't be lost too much with like returning characters because there aren't that many and the ones that are are having like a resurgence as we've discussed of their own motives and the protagonists are all brand new characters who you can invest in from the start so yeah i suggest going and reading it um other than that i don't have much to say well i'll say also go back and read the saga uh vignettes because that does a lot of the this was the story from old Kamigawa, but it also kind of gives it as a, but this is why it's still relevant now. So it's that's also, that's also really good for doing a bit of world building. Between that and this story, yeah, it's kind of enough of a world build of, its, of itself for you to kind of understand what the whole set's going to be. Um, and then there will be like making magic articles and stuff coming out this yes. week and next week. So um, that will then have Mark Rosewater kind of breaking down how they designed each individual factions and all that kind yeah. of thing. So, I can imagine yeah. our Flavor Picks episode as well, uh, much like how we did with Kamigawa, where we did quite broad. I, I, I just know, just through seeing the cards that we've already seen, that I'm going be talking quite broadly about the set as a whole because there are some big ideas and some of the some of the mechanics as well are, are going to be pretty big and just i'm mm-hmm. going to say it now the cards that we have seen again ekaterina burmak <sighs> fucking knocking out of the park again absolutely mm-hmm. on fire that artist so yeah 
look out for those. Um, yeah. All right. All the alts and everything. Oh, it's such a pretty set. All sets. Of, again, I'm going to say it's every set probably going forward. It's just, set's fucking gorgeous. Magic's well, so guys, pretty these days. It's so gorgeous. Magic is on fire at the moment. Like, I know, I know, believe me, we were doing this podcast in the very fucking thick of the bad times, okay? We know as a podcast how bad the story got and how bad and money grabby a lot of the card design got there for a while. I'm telling you, it's really fucking good at the moment. So let's just enjoy it whilst it's here. Uh, all right. Well, that remains me to say is thank you so much for listening. This has been Magic the Flavoring. We'll see you soon.